a new season of programming at the library. So glad to have you here. Uh, I'm Michelle Singer. I'm the adult programs coordinator. And um, you guys are matching. Well, we did that on purpose. Yeah, really. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm the shoes. Tiny bit of housekeeping. You know, there's a restroom in the back. There's also some water in the back if you need it. Thank you to Orca for taping us tonight. We're so happy to have Jane Twinell here with us tonight to, re for, to read from her book, All Time is Canyon. Um, it's so cool to hear that you have such a history with the Cala Covered Library. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually. Actually, I think it was my grandmother was president of the library, and then my father was president of the library oh, wow. for many years. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome, Pella Hubbard Library of Royalty. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Anyway, as I was telling Michelle, my father gave me a key to the library, and I used to come in on Sunday afternoons by myself when I was in high school. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> anyway, thanks, um, everybody, for coming. Um, and. I'm, it's always, I thought I'd see all kinds of people I knew given that I grew up here, but I'm the Carolness. I think you're the only one I know, I think. Anyway, um, thanks for coming. This um, Alzheimer's Canyon was actually written, uh, I'm a co author with my husband, Sky Yardley. He had um, dementia and uh, he chose to write about it. Um, he, when he was diagnosed in 2016, he was 66 years old and in otherwise perfect health. Um, and it came out of the blue, no family history. And he just dove into this instead of being in denial like so many people are who have dementia. He wanted to know everything about it. He read every book that the Burlington Library had. We were living in Burlington at the time. He talked to people about it. Um, it's a tiny picture on the back of the book, but I knitted it in his brain hat, and he would wear it, and people would say, oh, I really like your hat. I should have brought it. Anyway, he'd say, well, let me tell you about my hat. I have Alzheimer's. And people would say, oh, OK, goodbye. <laughs> or they would say, oh, god, you know, my mom had Alzheimer's, or my wife has Alzheimer's, or whatever. And it was a conversation starter. Um, and then he just dove into writing, and we had a blog. And um, in the second year after his diagnosis, we went on a nationwide speaking tour, speaking at 25 um, Unitarian and UCC congregations, and doing workshops and sermons um, until he wasn't able to anymore. Uh, he just wanted to be out, and he wanted to find his people. And he was so honored that at almost every congregation, somebody came out and said they had dementia, whereas they hadn't felt comfortable telling anyone before that. Um, so he was, very, he was very proud of the work he did. Um, and then as his illness escalated, um, I found I was unable to care for him. I had been, my first career was as a registered nurse and I'd worked in a memory care facility. So I was like, yep, yeah, I can do this, no problem except he started having hallucinations 24 hours a day. And he really liked to wake me up in the middle of the night to tell me about them. They were generally happy hallucinations. He was, um, in the daytime especially, he communed with nature. The trees had names and they talked to him. He, write, he writes about it in the book, The Flowers. I mean, it was like, it was really amazing. But you know, he would wake me up in the middle of the night to tell me something, and then he would go back to sleep and I wouldn't. And I got so, I wasn't getting any sleep. And we were living in a duplex in Burlington with our son and his partner, and um, Sayer, our son, said, you know, I'll ta tag team with you, and, and you know, we can t switch nights, and it just, it just escalated, and Sarah finally said, you know, I thought taking care of Sky would be all right, but I didn't realize it would involve not sleeping. Um, so we, we knew the Arbors in Shelburne, which is a memory care facility, uh, did, uh, has a respite program where people can stay for two weeks to two months to give the family a break. Um, and Sky, had, Sky and I had gone on a tour of the Arbors when he was early diagnosed, but we went back for another tour, spent a day, he went to activities, we had lunch, and, and he said, sure, you know, I'll do this so you can get some sleep. You know, I'll go for a couple of weeks, and I was like, oh, 
thank you, I'm going to lay on a beach and read novels and drink cocktails and get some sleep. And he went into the arbors on March 10th, 2020. And you all know what happened after that. Oh, yeah. So not only did he stay there for the rest of his life, I wasn't even allowed to see him until the end of June. And that was six feet apart outside mast and gown. And you try doing that with somebody with dementia. It doesn't go over well. Um, so the last year was hard. Um, he died in February of 2021, and I was allowed to be with him um, the last three days when he was dying. But the pandemic kind of screwed things up. Um, but Sky was extraordinarily happy at the Arbors because he wanted to find his people and their were his people. And the staff loved him, and he loved it there. He never asked to come home. He never tried to escape. He just settled in, and that was, at that point, he didn't know our home was our home. So he was fine there because he, he never, you know, it, that was home all of a sudden. Um, and the staff told me a wonderful story that so at the point he was at the Arbors, besides all the hallucinations, he had, he had reached the point where he physically couldn't um, take care of himself. He couldn't dress himself. He couldn't feed himself. He was in diapers. Um, he walked with a shuffle with his head down. Um, but if he felt a staff member was agitated or upset, he would walk up to them, stand next to them calmly, and then turn and say, are you OK? Can I help you? <laughs> and they were like, this is the most amazing thing ever, like that he could sense that, even though he couldn't do all those other things. Um, and they felt like they learned from him that they took up doing that with the residents who were getting agitated. So it was like, oh, this guy did it. Good things for the world. So anyway, after he died, I. Um, Organized the blog stuff, found myself a publisher at Rootstock, and that was great. And they had a wonderful graphic designer, <laughs> my daughter Dana. <laughs> and Dana's good friend Marisa was my editor. It was very exciting. It was a great process. Um, and it's called Alzheimer's Canyon. Um, that was Sky's um, metaphor, one way in and no way out. And he wrote um, 11 episodes of the Alzheimer's Canyon parable about this guy that finds himself being flagged off the highway. So I'm going to read that. First episode of Alzheimer's Canyon. And there's some salty language, just to warn you. <laughs> Alzheimer's Canyon, the arrival. WTF, this rutted off ramp isn't on the map or the GPS either. And actually, there's no choice. The huge reflective barrier informs me that the highway ahead is closed, road ends. This grubby detour is my only way out of here. Sure enough, there's Dr. P wearing a highway patrol outfit, directing traffic, making sure I get off the interstate now. Kind of a pain in the ass, because I've been making good time up on the four lane across the high country. The driving has been easy, spectacular at times. Wide open country, mesas, buttes, purple mountain majesty, you know, all that stuff. The road signs out here tell you the altitude when you enter the next town, and I've been enjoying how I've been effortlessly climbing up and up without any perceptible strain on the vehicle. Nice. But now this detour, WTF indeed. I mean, planning my trip, I knew that Alzheimer's Canyon was in the area, but I just wasn't all that interested. It's an old person destination, right? And whatever else I am, I sure don't see myself as elderly. But again, there's no choice. I know Dr. P isn't going to let me camp here on the interstate exit. He's got to keep the traffic flowing. Dr. P gives me a friendly but authoritative wave as I pass by. It's only as I'm gaining speed on the narrow, bumpy, pathetic excuse for an off-ramp that I notice that the other highway signs say, one way, no U-turns. Approaching Alzheimer's Canyon, drive with care watch for slow moving vehicles. I checked and this road I'm on isn't even on my fold up map. 
The canyon itself is on the map, though, and if I read it right, the thing is phenomenally huge, especially compared to the skinny track I'm on to get there. This approach road is pleasant enough, if a little lonesome. Good thing it's posted for one-way traffic, because there really isn't room for anyone getting out this way. Finally, a huge billboard lets me know that the Alzheimer's Canyon Visitors Interactive Center is just ahead. Also, parking lots 1 through 275. Good afternoon. How can we help you? Asks the smiling AmeriCorps worker behind the counter. Well, I, I guess I could use a map or a guide or something, I respond. Of course, we have these guides to the canyon itself. Also accommodations. Will you be camping in your RV? Um, I, I don't have an RV, just my own little car. I only got here because of a detour on the interstate. Well, yes, we have options here for you. For instance, you could try the homeless encampment in Area B past the dumpsters. They may have room for you under a piece of plastic. They're always getting new sheets in over there. Or if you prefer the hotel, they have a spot. It's $12,000 a month. Or maybe there's a waiting list. I really don't know. Well, actually, I was trying to work some of the interactive exhibits over there, and I think they might be broken. Or maybe I'm not running them right. Oh, you're fine. They don't do anything unless you're a caregiver, the attendant grins. Unless you've got grandma out there in your RV, I don't guess you're a caregiver. So since you aren't, I guess you're a sufferer, and we really don't have anything for sufferers. But, but I don't have an RV. Well, if you're in the market, we have a good selection of generally used motorhomes right now in Area E. Well, can I just look at the canyon while I'm here? Of course, that's what this guide is all about. Oh yeah, I answer, I saw that one. I couldn't make any sense of it. The only English words on it said, start here. Exactly, it tells you everything you need to know. Start here? Sure, sir, but where? Right where you are. But wait, how do I find the overlook, the vista, whatever? Don't worry, you already found us. You're all set now. She's grinning again, but I'm getting irritated with this whole Alice in Wonderland routine. Look, have you even got a guide in English? Sir, of course it's in English. You read it yourself. No, 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 no. You've got a big pile of typos here, young lady. See, it says star here, and the rest of the map is blank. No trails, no landmarks, nothing. I can't even use my compass. It's totally useless. Sir, if you're anxious, I can get you a prescription. <laughs> In the meantime, you may want to get started. Started doing fucking what? Man, I'm ready to be out of this place. Well, sir, everyone's path is different. We can't predict what yours will be like, except that it's all downhill from here. So anyway, he goes on to have so many adventures, and I'm sorry that you know if the the muse stopped at uh, episode 11, but it really, in retrospect, it followed his path, even though he wrote it early on in his first year after diagnosis. So anyway, so let's see. What else can I offer? Did he write? all the chapters up to a point, or did you co-write them? He, he wrote most of it in the beginning. I wrote, maybe the first year I wrote two or three things, you know, t from my perspective as his spouse. Yeah. Um, and he wrote until a year and three months before he died. And at that point, he wasn't able to dress himself or bathe himself or get into bed by himself but he could still write. It was pretty amazing. It took him a while, Yeah. Um, but he could do that. Writing or dictating, or how was he doing it? Ty uh, typing on his computer. Mm -hmm. Some of the cu last couple ones were dictated, I think. The, well, there was the one when I asked him questions, and that was dictated, but the very last one he wrote, he wrote himself. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, here's a, um, this is, and some people um, who have early stage Alzheimer's have read this and said, Sky nailed it, according to mm -hmm. their experience, mm -hmm. that he really described it well. Um, so this is a little short, funny one. Um, Sky and I both are uh, avid gardeners. We gardened our whole adult life. So uh, this is what happened when he tried to garden. It's called Demented Logic. 
A couple of weeks or so ago, I decided to plant some fall spinach in the garden. I had some space and the weather was still good. So after checking with Jane, I bought some seeds and prepared a place for them. Because I remembered being forgetful lately, exclamation point, I carefully followed the planting directions on the packet, including marking the area with good sized stakes. And then I waited, and I waited, some more, and more. These brand new seeds were just not coming up despite frequent watering, I think, and good wishes. Not a single one. But I remember I was so careful making my rows, laying the seeds in there, just like the package said to do. Now think, Sky, rev those neurons up. What exactly do I remember doing? Getting out the seed packet, yes. Pulling out the rows, yes. Placing the seeds at the proper depth, yes. Covering the seeds, hmm, no. Now wait, maybe I did plant those seeds. I mean, it would make sense if I did. After all, I did all the other steps, I think. But it would also make sense that I didn't. After all, there was not a single spinach plant to show for it. The memory trace for that short activity does not seem to still be available, if it ever was. If I try hard, can I call it up? No, well, maybe. Perhaps common sense, a cognitive skill now slowly but steadily dwindling away can help. It used to when I was faced with puzzles and mysteries. The first step in applying common sense is to gather reliable data, paying particular attention to new or unusual or odd information. In the case of the missing spinach, the fact that not even one of the seeds germinated might be important. What else? Well, I seem to remember several of the key parts of the story, numbers one through three. I have a continuing set of thoughts I will call remembering, quote, these activities. And number four, a complete blank. And watering? That wasn't even on the list. Again, so what? It felt like maybe I could trust my perceptions, my little memory of this little event, or more exactly, my non-memory of a non-event. I sure wanted it to all make sense. Logically, it could make some sense. Maybe, especially in a demented world. Spanakopita, anyone? <laughs> He's very funny. <laughs> He's very funny. He did. He had a great sense of humor. Did he figure out what happened? With the spinach? Yeah. I think he just didn't plant the seeds. I don't know. <laughs> or he could do like bird seeds, things like spinach seeds. I don't know. You know, whatever. It's like whatever. We had no spinach. That's okay. We lived with that. Um, but you had to, you know, what I learned was that you had to be prepared for anything to happen, because you didn't ever know. Um, so, anyway, I should. He didn't have a tendency to wander. That was not one of his. Thank God, no. Mm -hmm. Only once I caught him going out the door in the middle of the night. Um, he was he was worried. We were in this duplex in Burlington with our son and his partner, and he was worried about Emma, and he wanted to go find her and he was he was headed out the door in the winter at 3 a.m. He was dressed though. <laughs> that was a, that was when he could still dress himself. Um, but no, he didn't wander. Thank God. But he did um, eventually he always loved riding his bike. Riding his bike brought him a lot of peace and Burlington has great bike paths. Um, so he spent a lot of time hanging out by the lake and riding his bike and it was really tough when he was unable to ride, he didn't have the strength to ride his bike anymore, so he took up going on walks. And one time he went out for a walk and he was gone for a really long time and I was like, uh-oh, what has happened? And I got a phone call from our dentist's office and he was lost, but he recognized the sign at the dentist's office and went in and they called me. That was the last time he took a walk by himself. Mm -hmm. But that was only about a month or so before he went to the arbors. So yeah, he loved the he loved the natural world. Um, okay, so he died when he was sixty-eight. He was seventy. Seventy. Yeah. <clears throat> and it turns out on autopsy that he had both Lewy body dementia and Alzheimer's dementia because um, they can't really, you know, they can only they can't get an official diagnosis until they do an autopsy. 
Um, and so that was the explanation for the hallucinations. <clears throat> that came from the Lewy body side, um, as opposed to the Alzheimer's side. He was always cheerful then. My he was. Oh, thank God, he was. He, he didn't get, a lot of people get angry. Yeah. Or anxious. Or anxious. He got anxious. Yeah. yeah. And this was, um, well, Carolyn, you knew Skye, but yeah. Skye never had an anxious day in his life until this happened. You know, it, I relied on him to keep me calm because he was a very calm person. Um, and that was the hardest part for him, getting anxious because he didn't know how to like deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, What kind of work did he do? He was a family mediator. And I think that's, that skill was still with him at the Arbors. Mm -hmm. That he, he knew he could read people and help um, with conflicts, solving conflicts. Yeah, he was really good at that, thank goodness. It helps to have somebody in the family that does that. <laughs> so, um, let me read one that I wrote. So I, I took up writing more the last couple of years. This is called Nighttime Shenanigans. Last night in the middle of the night, Sky reached over and patted me then abruptly drew his hand away. Oh, I'm sorry, he said, I thought you were Jane. I, I am Jane. <laughs> oh, good, he said, and went back to sleep. <laughs> Night times are always an adventure around here these days, and preparing for bed has become a new experience. Sky no longer remembers how to get ready for bed, so I've made him a written checklist. Brush teeth, pee, take melatonin, take off clothes, Get into bed, take off glasses, put glasses in glasses case, put glasses case in bedside stand drawer. I haven't yet had to supervise teeth brushing and peeing, but once those tasks are done, I do have to escort Skye to his side of the bed. He often can't remember where and how to get into bed. Actually, the get into bed activity is much more than that. I have to direct Sky something like this. Sit on the side of the bed. Swing your legs up onto the bed. Sometimes that's in the wrong direction, so I have to be ready. Scoot your butt down, and I point toward the bottom of the bed. When he's far enough to lie down, I no longer tell him to lie down, because then he continues to scoot his butt down. I've learned to say, now lie back. Once his head hits the pillow, I cover him up, remove his glasses, and stow them safely away. He no longer trusts himself to do this step. And I hope he goes to sleep and stays asleep. I never know. The melatonin has decreased his nighttime physical agitation and attacking, and some nights he sleeps through the night and wakes up at a reasonable hour. Then there are the other nights. Two nights ago, he woke me up at 4 a.m. to tell me we had to go outside and dig up the water line. But it's still dark, we can't do that now. But we have to, the water main is broken. There's a tree down on it. Whatever, it's dark, we can't work in the dark. I'm trying to play along. But we have to, he insists, check all the faucets. I get up, turn on all the faucets. The sound of running water does not seem to soothe him. The water is fine. No, no, we have to fix the water line. I try something new. We're in a city, public works will take care of it. We're in a city? Yep. <laughs> and on and on we went. Sky got more and more agitated about the broken water line, and despite me holding him, speaking to him soothingly, either playing along or giving him facts, nothing worked. I gave up. How about some coffee, I asked. That sounds great, said Sky. <laughs> and at 4.30, we were up for the day. Coffee in hand, lights on, and me reading from the online New York Times finally soothed him, even though the story was about Iran and our almost war. He had his first nap at 8.45 and mine was at 11. <laughs> Expect the unexpected. Mm. I'm curious, have you found like playing along is the way to go or debating is the way to go? No, playing along is the way. Divert the topic, so yeah. play along. Playing, playing along, unless it's something dangerous, right. and then you need to divert the person, like when he was going out the door because something was wrong with Emma. Right. Um, you know, I had to tell him that Emma was okay and lead him back to bed. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, you play along. 
it's I'm glad I have a theater background. It's all mm -hmm. about improv, really. <laughs> you know if that's a common uh, trait or experience with other, or that's yes. what you found out. Yes, uh, and, and that's okay. what the, the professionals are being taught now, okay. is, is don't ever argue with somebody. Just go along. Just go along with it, and, unless I say it's a, a, a safety issue. Right. Great, thank you. Yeah, no, he, you know, he, the, the last year at the Arbors, when he, he would call me frequently, but he, he was always traveling, and he was calling to tell me where he was and what he was doing, and he was, you know, he was in Paris, or he was in Ontario, or he was in New Orleans, or he was, he, he was, he was in White River, and he was about to get on the train and come home, like, you know, and he was always so happy. It's like, whatever, just, you know, tell me about where you are. He loved to travel. It was something he did a lot. He could easily call you. Yes, the, that was... You know, because of the pandemic, that was how the staff was handling family contact. So the staff would had a phone for the residents, and so they would call me, and he would talk. To you. Gotcha. So yeah. He, he didn't dial. No, no, he had lost his uh, ability to use his phone or his computer a year before that, probably. And it sounds like I'm just thinking where my mother is. They locked everybody in the room. They could not leave the room oh, for really? over a year. A year. All the meals were brought. Yeah, during COVID. Yeah, during COVID. The Arbors had you could move around freely. People could move around freely, yeah. but nobody could come in. Right. It but just the staff. You get it, leave your room. Yeah, yeah. No, they they you actually. Well, the Arbors it has two wings, and they did keep people had to stay in one wing, right, mm -hmm. or the other wing. Um, and, you know, I have to give them a lot of credit because they were so used to the families coming in every day sure. to help them. And then it was just the staff. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and luckily, nobody ever got COVID there. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, it was incredible, but it also sucked. Yes? Does he talk about, in the book, like, how we first noticed that things were starting to change mm -hmm. with him? Um, I, mean, I, I talked guess, about that. I mean, I think it's something we all worry about. Yeah, right. Of course. He, um, and, and I described this in the book, he, he started worrying about his um, memory in 2012. Um, but you can go online and you can take these tests, you know, and he would take it and he would do fine. And, you know, they could get all the recommendations about eating well and exercise and blah, 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 in my chart. Um, and he already did all those things. And so he just chalked it up to maybe he wasn't really paying attention or whatever. And it wasn't until 2015 when I realized he had lost his spatial abilities. And that it, we, had, we were avocational carpenters. And at that point, we had built five houses. And we volunteered in New Orleans after Katrina helping people rebuild. And this was happened at Dana's house. <laughs> Sky and Dana were laying flooring, and I could hear Dana. I was in the other room painting, and I could hear Dana saying, "Sky, that's not how it goes. This is not how it goes." And I thought, "Sky doesn't know how to lay flooring. Like he's laid a lot of flooring." Um, and at that point, I started encouraging him to get tested. Dana started encouraging him to get tested. Um, he he lost his sense of direction. He he couldn't back the car up. You know, it was just really weird. And it wasn't until we were renovating this duplex in Burlington with our son and his partner, and we were doing all the carpentry work, and Sky realized he couldn't do carpentry work anymore. And he's like, okay, I'll get tested. Because that was something, you know, he had done for 40 years. And it was all mental inability, not physical. I mean, he, he right. Physical. No, he, he would take a measurement and yeah, he would, basically. and he'd write it down, right. and he'd go out to the sawhorses with the lumber, and he'd pick up the skill saw, and he would have no idea what to do. Yeah, and we, in 2018, we managed to build a house, but he, I was the brains, and he was the brawn, basically. I did the carpentry work, and he carried lumber and helped push up walls, and we managed to do it. Are you willing to talk about the progression a little bit? Say more. Um, well, my older brother has dementia, and I'm always sort of thinking about him because he's in Mexico. Yeah. You know, how, how it progressed with him, possibly. Well, everybody's different. Yeah, that's true. You know, and 
with Sky, he, he, he seemed pretty much himself, except for, you know, losing short-term memory. He still had long-term memory. Um, do you have anything to offer about how it went? I mean, the, you, you guys used to play cards a lot, and then he couldn't play cards, and you'd go hiking, but then he couldn't yeah. go hiking. And it's a, I think it's surprising how many things we do in our lives are mental activities. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm gonna take this off so you can see my face. Um, like the act of hiking, he was physically strong enough to do it, but was just like, there's a rock and another rock, and I'm supposed to figure out where to put my feet around these rocks, and I, that's too hard to do, so like, mm -hmm. I can't move my feet because my brain can't figure out how to navigate the trail. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, hiking is a purely physical activity. But no, it's also mental activity. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, I think, I mean, I think it goes back to, uh, Jane's minister does some sermons and she just wrote this follow-up dementia sermon about how you retain your self, like your, your self self, who you are till the end. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be true that like, this ability to mediate conflict and to tune into feelings and like I visited with Sky two days before he died and we like sang songs together because he and I have done that for forever and those things stayed but like reading maps and losing the spatial awareness and how to play games and right I think yeah I don't know I think it was those more practical but he never really cared about practical things like this was a man who would feed himself on a piece of bread and cheese and an orange just and like wander around and meet people. Like that was more interesting than <laughs> dealing with finances or like logistics or like he didn't care about logistics. Yeah, no, I handled the logistics. <laughs> logistics. So I don't know. And more and more anxiety, I think. Yeah. The progression of that too. Right. But he knew who you guys were. He knew us till the end, which I think is very unusual. But I was certainly very grateful. Um, yeah, no, we, he did. Do you think the anxiety comes from, I'll say, fear of the unknown? If you're losing your sense of memory, then yeah. you're concerned, you don't, you're afraid. I would, I would be afraid yeah. of what I don't know, right. that I used to know, and you get anxious. I'm right, yeah, 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 he, he would, and, and, and like Dana said, like hiking wasn't just hiking, like all of a right. sudden, you know, okay. And, and once he started having hallucinations, he started having double vision, yeah. which made that worse. And he, bless his heart, was the, he, once he was diagnosed, he no longer um, wanted to drive long distance. He was still driving in town in Burlington. Yeah. Um, and we had talked about that, like, you know, when is it going to not be safe for you to drive anymore? Right. And he, there, there's a thing, I don't know if I, maybe I have time to read it, um, where he had a hallucination while he was driving. Here, I'll read it. 66. Voluntary driving ban. Has it finally arrived? <sighs> Sorry. The end of my 53 year driving career. And is career the right word? Yes, I think so. I'm having no trouble at all remembering the excitement of the year I was 15, the year I came eligible to take the test for my learner's permit. For some reason, teenagers in Massachusetts had to wait, not until 17, not until 16, 15 and a half was good enough. The waiting was interminable in my case. And besides, it felt like there was some kind of magic going on. One day I was too young to drive, and the next day it was okay. I just had to take a multiple choice written test and a vision test, and then I could climb behind the wheel of the family Chevy Impala, a tank of a vehicle if there ever was one. Is this really fair to the other drivers on the road? I mean, the ones who knew what they were doing? I had collected a lot of semi-useless book knowledge about cars and motors. I was all over my two magazine subscriptions, Popular Mechanics and Mad. <laughs> Back then I was able to identify every American car by its radiator and could tell you more than you needed to know about the evolution of tail fin design and placement and hood ornaments. Fascination. Fair or not fair, the process of getting behind the wheel rocked and split open my world. I remember realizing Okay, that's, um, anyway, I remember realizing that my driveway was intimately connected to virtually every other road in all of North and South America. <laughs> I just needed to make the correct turns and keep buying gas. 
<laughs> Suddenly, my traveling options seemed boundless. Realistically, though, I wasn't going to buy all that gas, and I didn't even have a car. But that didn't stop my horizons from expanding. Then I stumbled upon a most elegant solution to the gas and car limitations, hitchhiking. You know, this is the late 60s, early 70s. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't remember my first ride, but it was the first of many hundreds of encounters that served to consistently define how I understood and appreciated this American world, amazing world. I was the American boy taking off in a car to find himself. It took over a decade for me to afford my own vehicle, but I got there, eventually parlaying my love of the roads and unpredictable adventures into paying work Sorry, this part that gets emotional. That involved a weekly round trip truck route from northern Vermont to Boston and points in between. Best of all, those roads led me to Jane, my amazing life partner and now care partner. I had a restaurant. He delivered my produce. <laughs> my romance anywhere. Making the transition to not driving should have been easier, though. I haven't noticed hood ornaments in decades. A car is no longer the key to enable access to a more wonderful world. A car is a car. But have I mentioned the hallucinations? And how about the double vision? It doesn't happen all the time, but enough to get my attention. The last time I drove, I slowed down for a pedestrian making her way across the city street. I tried to make eye contact as we met. But in the literal blink of an eye, she smiled and vanished. When I got home, I told Jane that was my last time behind the wheel. As time goes on, the hallucinations and double vision come more often. Here's an example. Sitting safely in the passenger seat, I noticed two tractor trailers right in front of me. They're shouldering side to side into each other, and I can't understand how they can keep this up without one of them at least going into the ditch. Sure enough, the one on the right suddenly lurches rightward and plows through the woods without slowing a bit. The truck on the left is bashing and crashing into whatever there is to crash into on the interstate. I tense and ready myself for a fireball of disaster, which never materializes. <laughs> These experiences and others like them make it clear that my driving days are done. Besides, Jane became the principal driver once Dr. Alzheimer came on the scene. Really, this change is another example of a practical, sensible adjustment to a permanent new reality. Still, it hurts sometimes. It was not easy being the driver when he would like scream at me about these trucks about to have an accident. And there were no trucks on the road. It was just us with nothing there. So that was, you know, the hallucinations and double vision. He couldn't play the piano anymore because of the double vision, which was really hard for him because he loved playing the piano. So. He just had a great attitude. He had a fabulous attitude, thank God for small favors. Because this was hard enough to handle if he'd had a bad attitude. Mm -hmm. I hate to think. And I know you said it, but what was the span of time that when it really became an issue to when he went into the home? Um, Two years, three years? He, he was diagnosed in the summer of 2016 and he went to the Arbors in March of 2020. Okay. And died a year later, yeah. Did he write? I mean, I'm just blown away that he, he could write and have the sense of humor. Like, did he do a lot of writing before he was diagnosed, or this was? It, it, people, a lot of people ask me that. That's, yeah. You know, he was a really good writer, but he um, he went to Amherst for college, dropped out with a semester to go to go be a hippie. You know, <laughs> like people did in 1972, and I think he was afraid to write, he, that he was channeling his Amherst professors, you know, that people were going to criticize him. And I remember, you know, when he took up, you know, because before this, he didn't really, you know, like if we went on a trip, he might keep a little journal or, right. you know, I mean, send people emails. He, he wrote a few sermons. Um, but he really took up writing seriously. Like he wrote, he, he and his girlfriend at the time lived in Iceland for a year in 1976, 77, and he, you know, wrote a whole memoir thing, you know, about it's like I got to write this stuff, you know, while I still remember. Anyway, but he he wrote really well, and I'm glad he finally got to do it because he really loved with an amazing sense of humor. A complete amazing sense of humor. Yeah, no, it's you'll laugh and you'll cry when you read the book. 
And so I held back, you know, so that it was his work. So his name is on the front of that? It's Jane Boynell and Scotty Bridge. It's both of us. Co-authors. <laughs> Not just me. Was there any um, family history? Other relatives? You know, not really, but he, both his parents had neurological diseases. His father had MS, his mother had narcolepsy, and his sister has MS. And so I just wondered if there was a neurological weakness, mm -hmm. though nothing in the other generations. You know, his, his aunt died in 20, when she died, 2017, and she was 92, and she just died from being old. Yeah, no, it was a complete mystery. Mm -hmm. And and his, his his doctor at the Arbors, the Arbors has their own doctor, and she was fabulous, Yale Berry. And you know, after the autopsy, you know, we had a long conversation, but it's like nobody knows why this happens. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. Yes. In the first thing that you read, he talked about Dr. P. Yes. Who was that? That was Dr. Uh, Pendleberry, who's the doctor at the memory clinic at UVM, where we went for oh, the okay. initial diagnosis. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering, you know, uh, for people who are just learning or maybe getting into it, is, is your book a good, uh, kind of like a user's guide, if you will, of, hey, here are some things to prepare for? Well, I like to think so. Right. And I did, at the end, I did write a sort of Jane and Skye's, you know, helpful hints mm -hmm. about how to deal with a dementia diagnosis. Yeah. It's a pretty good list of like what to do and what to expect, like getting, you know, financial affairs in order, you know, talking with doctors about all your care directives. Like, yeah. I like that the book is the personal experience, but then at the end there were like those like practical things to do too. Right. It's really I you know I learned a lot from, from this even though I'm a publisher. <laughs> I I I didn't even know that um, hallucinations were part of the disease. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. just hearing about that but, but not only learning about that but then but reading his actual experiences with them. There's a whole chapter where he describes the garden gnomes that he's talking to. And right. it's just it's like this you know beautiful sad thing. And it's yeah, he was so frustrated that the rest of us couldn't see all the garden gnomes. I want to talk about garden gnomes. <laughs> no, it's like, really? Yes, garden gnomes. I love them. <laughs> were they good or were they mischievous? No, both. <laughs> mischievous, yes. It really makes you wonder, though, what, it, like, what is this disease? You know, it's attacking your brain, but are there other worlds that you're yeah. going with? Like, yeah. yeah. He was in a different reality. He was in a different reality. Like, like, is where is that reality? Yeah. How do you access that? And, and it's really quite, quite an interesting so, trip. Yeah. I, I sometimes, I sometimes wonder if folks yeah. with dementia in previous times before we had this language were yeah. classified as uh, shamans or like mystics yeah. or spiritual leaders of some kind who were accessing other planes in some yeah. way. I, I guess so, but I'm experiencing Alzheimer's with my mother, and I'm just so in awe of the writing, and my mother was such an avid reader, and she can't read any, I mean, she can yeah. read, but she can't retain, and she doesn't understand meaning, and, yeah, you know, this guy so, was, it, it yeah, was so painful amazing. for him when he couldn't read anymore, because he yeah. loved reading. Yeah. One, so, earlier you mentioned he would, uh, comment about the traveling somewhere. Yeah. Was it in reference to past travels or this was completely fabricated? Like he's never it, been to Germany. He's not well, no, to Germany. He, he, he traveled extensively. So, so most of it made some kind of sense. Okay. But when he told me he was like in Northern Ontario, I'm like, really? <laughs> I don't think you've ever been to Northern, Northern Ontario. Ontario. <laughs> I've been to Northern, Northern Ontario. Ontario. It's not a recall of an actual 
experience. Right. It is a right. It's it like was a dream state. It was something, you know, like like we spent a lot of time in France, and so one of the calls was he was at Charles de Gaulle Airport and he lost his passport. And could I get him a new passport? You know, it was like okay, sure. Mm -hmm. um, and and right after he got diagnosed, we went to France on a long planned yeah. trip, and. Because he'd lost his spatial reasoning, mm -hmm. he couldn't read a map, he couldn't figure out how to use his metro ticket, but he was fluent in French and he could still talk to everybody in French. You know, like that retained. Yeah. Whereas my French is terrible. And that's so interesting how somebody's brain, like just parts of it that still work really well and other parts just, just go, go away. away. And you don't ever know right. from person to person how that's gonna Manifest. Right. My brother was like that. He spoke five he spoke different languages and we went out to breakfast with him and there was a Greek uh, waitress and he started speaking Greek out of the blue. Right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. it's the brain is a mysterious thing completely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the financial aspect of it? That was pretty uncomfortable, <laughs> the financial <laughs> aspects. The arbors cost ten thousand dollars a month. And that's just the room fee. You know, medications, diapers, other stuff is on top of that. Um, and, you know, one of the things I said in the helpful hints, I mean, as soon as he got diagnosed, I started a special savings account because I knew someday it was either going to be home care or a placement somewhere. And that was going to cost money. You know, if you're poor, you can, it, it'll be covered by Medicaid. But if you're not poor, you got to cough it up. And he was really, at one of the phone calls, he called me and said, I'm trying to figure out how to do some kind of like barter thing here to cover the cost of, you know, <laughs> me staying here, you know, some kind of volunteer work. He said, you know, because it costs $300 a month to stay here. <laughs> if only. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Did you have long term care insurance? No. Yeah. He was nothing wrong with him, right? You know? Out of the blue. Out of the blue, he was six. You know, he just turned sixty-six, yeah. and you know, we were busy having a life, you know, traveling, and we were spending winters in New Orleans, still helping there, and summers in France, and mm -hmm. it's like, oh wait, <laughs> we don't get to do that anymore now. Were there any um, support groups that you guys were a part of? Excellent question. No. <laughs> uh, I asked Dr. P. I was hoping that was in the book. Well, it is. I, I'll tell you briefly what happened. I, um, I asked Dr. P. at the visit when Sky got the diagnosis. I said, and what services do you have for me yeah. at the memory clinic? I don't know, he said. This is a man who has run the memory clinic for 25 years. He said, maybe you should get an appointment with a social worker. And I'm like, okay, we can get an appointment with a social worker, which took six months, because they had one social worker for 800 families. And, and she apologized once we got to see her. No, we don't have any support groups here. She says, it's just me, I don't have time. So we found um, a support group for couples, except they, it was five couples, and they had been together for five years. And it, we weren't accepted as new people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so we started our own support group. <laughs> and we, um, we did that for four months, but it wasn't successful because the people with dementia didn't want to talk about it. The families wanted to talk about it. And Skye just was desperate to meet other people with dementia to talk about it. So we finally gave up that. And he and I both ended up on Zoom support groups of people across the country. Um, there's a program called Dementa, Dementia Mentors. And he, so he was on a weekly Zoom um, until he didn't really understand Zoom, so he didn't do it for that long. And he found it a little, it was more like a social club, and he really wanted to like talk about, hey, we're dying, <laughs> you know? And, and actually, he wanted, I looked for a therapist. I went through several therapists and never, didn't find anybody I liked. He, I found a therapist for him who said she specialized in elder care and dementia. 
and he wanted to talk about dying. And she said, no, 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 we're gonna talk about your, the life you're gonna have while you're still living. And he's like, I don't wanna talk about dying. <laughs> and she wouldn't go there, so that was unsuccessful. But I was in a wonderful caregiver support group that met on Zoom, that I, we met once a month. And that was a lifeline for me. And then um, it's other retired ministers who were caring for somebody, not necessarily with dementia, but cancer or heart disease or some dementia. Um, and as, as I say, um, some of us have graduated and we started a grief support group for the people whose spouses have died. And that's also a lifeline that's once a month on Zoom. Um, it's really great to be with other people who have lost their spouses. There's so much in common, even if people died from different <coughs> kinds of diseases and situations. So, yeah, now, uh, hopefully, um, I, I know there's a new support group that's run, in, and this is in Chinton County, like I don't know what happens in the rest of Vermont, but the social worker from the Arbors has started a support group outside of the Arbors, separate from the Arbors. Mm -hmm. But um, it's something that's desperately needed, completely. Mm -hmm. I did an event yesterday in Pomfret, and they said that, that there's a really good support group down there at one of the nursing homes down there. Yeah, Woodstock is that? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, no, You mentioned something. earlier something I learned tonight the two different types of Alzheimer's. Can you briefly well, there's, there's different or? kinds of dementia. Alzheimer's is one kind, it's the most common kind of okay. dementia. Um, Lewy body dementia is um, another kind that's okay. not as common. And Sky had both, which is highly unusual. You usually have one or the other. There's also frontotemporal lobe dementia, vascular dementia, and then people with Parkinson's um, and ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, also develop dementia. Okay. Yeah. And it's just, uh, the differences are in how it affects your memory? Right, and in what parts of the brain it attacks yeah. and how it yeah, how it manifests in the brain, yeah, the, the biological changes yeah. in the brain. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Did you ask about any medicines that would delay it or There's, there, um, there are a couple medications that may delay things in some people, and Sky tried one of those and it made him violently ill. So that lasted a <laughs> week. And he said no more. And you know, like he kind of like he coming up with more stuff, but nothing really has been shown to really work. When you say violently ill, do you mean just violently? He was, and well, it reminded me of um, for those of you in this room who have been pregnant. <laughs> it reminded me of the first trimester, of you know just queasy all the time, and you never knew when you were going to throw up, and feeling exhausted, and. It was terrible. We're like, yeah, it's no more of this. <laughs> well, thank you, Jane. I want to make sure. Bear Pond, 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 Bear Pond,